everyone. Alrighty. So this is the fifth and final of our lecture series with me. Uh, you'll see me again for the workshop as per the course outlined. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture series. Today we're going to try and wrap it up. Um, it's a great pity that one can't cover, some, cover more with you um, because we, we've done quite a lot of fun things, at least I think. But today you'll see um, a, a true sort of finishing off of what we've been trying to cover. And uh, the readings will all come up today so that you can enjoy them uh, in your leisure in the holiday. Of course, there's nothing from my side that requires them to be read tomorrow or this week. Uh, and hopefully at the end of the class I can gather some interest and we can just see if you think in future it would be good having more of this um, and if you've enjoyed this as an alternative. Today we're going to wrap up on the Cambridge Capital Controversy. Uh, it's important to let's just lay down some of the grounds for why it's called the Cambridge Capital Controversy. Yesterday I know the lecture attendance was very low, so we are carrying on a little bit from yesterday, but it's not going, you're not going to be at, a, at a too much of a problem for if you haven't come. The Cambridge Capital Controversy incorporates all the parts of the, the story we've been spreading. It's a big controversy which consists of multiple arguments. Um, we call them rounds. And it's a row that occurred between Cambridge and the UK with Straffer and Robinson on the one side and MIT which is in Cambridge Massachusetts and there we had some other people kind of as they could be prepared to take the punches uh, Samuelson do we know who Samuelson is? Anybody know who Samuelson is? Nothing. Okay, Samuelson wrote the first book on mathematical economics. It was Samuelson's mathema methods of, of mathematical economics which pioneered uh, what we now know, uh, what we use pretty much from first year. He was the one who did, took marginal rates of capital and marginal rates of labor uh, he forms part of, a, of the really sort of founder of the new neoclassical high analytical mathematical economics. There's Samuelson Bliss, who's a lesser known, um, Clark, um, and whoever else we meet along the way. All right. Yesterday, yesterday we looked at round one of the Cambridge Capital Controversy, and this was, I've sent you a paper which has this all summarized as part of the readings. Um, the reading is by Cohen and Harcourt, who are modern economists. And the reason I've given you this reading is because I understand I've set this as an essay topic, so you obviously want something to be working with. It's also been a recurrent theme throughout the course, and it's got quite a nice summary of everything. And you'll see that having now completed this course, you will be able to read that paper. While if you hadn't done what we've done, there would have been no way you could have made digestible sense of it. So I think that it will be quite a nice... A uh, little read for you, in part because you can pat yourself on the back to see how far you've come. They describe the Cambridge Capital Controversy in terms of these rounds. And round one is the one that we discussed yesterday. And round one starts with this idea of utility theory of value. We started from week one, how it links in to creating a is this leaving people behind. We want a very quick recap. We want to recap. Okay. So yesterday we spoke on the reswitching problem again, and we spoke about how the reswitching problem applies when we start dealing with production functions. 
I can't unfortunately give you the full recap, but you'll see it in yesterday's lecture four appendix, where there's an extract that talks through the reasoning behind why something like interest, which is a theme throughout these five lectures, causes a re-switch between processes. Where we spoke about, this is from our lecture, lecture number three, where we've got these two different processes and varying levels of interest and we have a re-switching that occurs between the two. And we spoke about that yesterday that this indeed works and we went into a fair bit of detail and there was a little confusion because I said to you that there are problems with the formulation of a production function in any form when it is aggregated into a firm level. This paper refers to the non-aggregated level, so the sort of, sort of direct process as being the one commodity production function. So when we're using a production function to analyze a single commodity, the production function indeed holds true, but the minute we start aggregating it over multiple production functions um, or processes in a firm, then we start to have problems and we start to have re-switching. And the way I showed that to you yesterday was to consider a gardening firm, which has got two processes. The first is that uh, we've got people who dig holes, and they need one spade, one shove, one bucket, and one pickaxe. And then we can say they're the planters, we need one plant, one bag of soil, and let's say that's it. And we spoke about how we can model the production process by being labor activated. So in each of these situations we have one unit of labor. When we analyze this, if we were to look at the dig process independently of the plant process and we increased it by a marginal amount, the margins would still make sense in this situation. But if we were to look at the planter process and increase it by a marginal amount, it would also make sense. But together, as a whole process, a dig and planting firm, aggregated level, the taking the margins do not occur. And we spoke about the root but the Ruth Cohen curiosity, which Robinson outlined, and that has to do with in what is capital measured? Yeah? It was Rand, wasn't it? It's Rand, and that was the entire problem, because we were speaking about in what was capital measured, and we see here that capital, when it's heterogeneous, as in the case here, because we've got two different systems, it's no longer, a, it's heterogeneous capital over here, a heterogeneous capital over here. These are homogeneous within itself, so, that's, so that process has this, that set of capital needs to come with that process, that set of capital needs to come with that process, but as a planting process, We have two different sets of capital, both of which are heterogeneous, and then we can't talk about units of capital because we would be essentially comparing the units of, say, a spade in one firm with, a, with the spade that you use to shovel the coal with the boiler in which the coal is there. 
So trying to compare those two things would be, mean that we can't compare how it is done. So we can't speak of simple units of capital. We need to use the Vixel Convention, which we spoke about back in lecture two, um, about capital being measured in rands or in dollars. And that has a problem, according to the Ruth Cohen curiosity of being um, of having an index value problem. Okay, now we, we've tried to do a whole lecture in 10 minutes and it's, it's, it's always at best barely successful. So let's try some of the other rounds which are just as important to this controversy. Um, and rest assured that this paper that I've picked you is, is doable with the knowledge that you had brought into yesterday's lecture. And that this essay topic is a very nice essay topic to want to write on as a memo essay and that you shouldn't be scared of it, I promise. So part one of the capital controversy, round one, can be summed up in a complicated explanation of the Vixel switching problem, this problem of two processes switching. And we just go into a little bit of detail and lay down exactly why this could be difficult. Round two, right, conclusion of round one, yeah. The conclusion of round one is although we acknowledge re-switching, the problem rate links to interest rates. So what is the good of quantity of capital, which since it depends on the rate of interest, can it be used for its traditional purpose to determine the rate of interest? If you're wondering here why he's talking about determining the rate of interest, it's because there, are, there were theories, and a lot of this neoclassical theory is based on the roundaboutness, the Austrian idea of roundaboutness, creating interest, because it is the length of the process which, which denotes the interest. I'm getting tempted to show you some things from yesterday, um, simply because the, the, this doesn't look like it's this. this we, I don't want this lecture to fall over because everybody was studying. At the same time, I'm not tempted, but I want to be nice. <laughs> Do you want to see the stuff from yesterday? Would that help? Is this just too high a level? Are you following? No, nothing. No, come, guys. Hello. Who's following? Who's not? All right. One minute. Here's the appendix from yesterday. It's an extract from a little book. It's very simple. It speaks about two production processes, technique A and technique B. It says that technique A and technique B could use two different combinations of inputs, labor, in two different sort of ways, depending on how, whether they use it in, one, in year T minus 1, or a little bit in year T minus 2, or in tier T. It shows that the rate of interest, 7, 1 plus R, so it's essentially accruing one year of interest for that 7, would be equal to 2, 1 plus R squared, two years of interest compounded here, plus six, zero years of interest. And it's showing that rate, rate is either equal to 0 0.5 or 1%. Why are we showing this? This example corresponds with this graph. Over here you'll see a combination of capital and labor, and there's a re-switching between the two. Now, how can you say that capital that the interest rate, the natural interest rate, is the rate which accrues to capital or which is determined by capital when, in fact, according to Schraffer's technique, critique, the capital cannot be used for its traditional purpose of determining the interest rate if it is indeed dependent on the interest rate. It's a circular argument. If the processes here, here we see a table of the different processes. 
according to the different interest rates, process A and process B and their respective outputs. If the respective outputs are changing, and we're trying to choose a, a solution which will optimize our outputs, which will optimize our profit, we can't, choose, we can't determine one independent of knowing the interest rate. We have to choose something that's independent of the interest rate, then the interest rate cannot be set by the process. Who was here yesterday who's following this? That's all bit. determine the interest rate. So that's exactly correct. So let's recap that. The interest rate determines which process you choose. Process A or process B. You cannot have a circular argument where you say that the capital determines the interest rate, but you determine the capital based on the interest rate. One of them has to be exogenous of the other. In our previous looks at in lecture four, we looked at how people were, and in lecture three, the Austrians, we looked at how interest rate was linked to this idea of capital. In here, we have to acknowledge that there is a, there, that, ex, that capital must be exogenous from interest rate. There can't be a cyclical linking of the two. And this is the critique that Schraffer points out. That's the conclusion of round one from yesterday. Now, next. Round two. Equilibrium and time. Differences versus changes. So, one of the essential tasks of theories of capital are to show why A purely static process can't necessarily be adequate. This is easiest explained in a setting of a solo growth model. Who's familiar with the solo growth model? Is everyone familiar with the solo growth model? Hands up if you're not. Okay. Solo growth model. says something like this. It says y is equal to a function of capital and labor, and that is a production function. Now, when we model the country according to the solo growth model, we say, ah, capital changed a little bit. Ah, labor changed a little bit. And we go about trying to say, well, that's why the GDP grew. That's the basic principle. That's all we need to understand. Now, there's a difference between equilibrium and time, and differences in capital, and changes. The way that analysis is happening here is that we are not looking at the process of capital accumulation. Instead, we are simply comparing one point in time with another point in time. So. The way people want to compare, and the way you compare production functions, is to consider, I use this much capital, 
that much labor to produce something. A little few, further in the future, I use this much capital and a little labor to produce something else. For example. Make it with one boat. Here's an example. We've reached an We've reached equilibrium in both of these cases. In these cases, you would have, you, if you were trying to do your basic micro analysis, you would say that people were substituted for capital. There are less people here and the same amount of capital. The problem is, is that the changes in the capital are not necessarily according to the same production function. So it links in with the re-switching. Here we've had a switching from process one to process two, but we're getting two fish. Now, the way that micro textbooks track these things is to say that we're in equilibrium in the one point and we're in equilibrium in another, but it doesn't follow the accumulation process. So we're looking at statics, static situations, and saying, well, this, this, this sums up the situation. We, in fact, you need to be asking yourself, why did they abort the boat and abort the rod in favor of two nets? And this, although it's a firm level example, the capital controversy here in round two relates to macroeconomic problems, which we spoke about in yesterday's lecture. The implication of the re-switching problem, round one, is very large for things like the solo model. When you're using Y as GDP, and this is how it works, it looks like this, pretty much, and that is solo. Sometimes called the solo swan model. The implications are very large because you are you can't necessarily make analysis between comparative growth parts. The way that it works is dependent firstly on your endowment rather than necessarily just what has happened. But the solo model has so-called steady states that occur in it. And these steady states are not, when you compare steady state to steady state of different people, it's not necessarily easy to do if you're not aware of the change that's occurred. take it out. This is the take-home message, in quotation. So don't stress. Here's the take-home message. The real source of trouble is the confusion between the comparisons of equilibrium positions and the history of a process of accumulation. We might suppose that we can take a number of still photographs of economy, each in the economy instant in stationary equilibrium. While this is an allowable thought process, says it is not allowable to, oh dear, to flip, this word is flip, not inverted commas here, yeah? flip the stills through a projector in order to obtain a moving process of capital accumulation. The accumulation is path dependent and it obscures the, com the comparative statics capture or obscure the accumulation process depending on how you look at it. And this can be shown to be a problem related to the way we speak about capital, which we spoke about in lecture four. Then there is 
the aggregate production functions problem. There were a few defenses which were tried to be made. Solo launched a empirical defense which said on a one commodity model, we can show that in fact this holds. And we do know that in a one commodity model, uh, we can show with a production function that we can model it quite accurately. But his defense ends there. And in fact, he's, it's almost strange enough that he states that if we were to consider, he says he makes a very humorous uh, defense, but not a very strong one. He says that if we were to have to consider production functions that involve more than one process, uh, God should have given us the, percent, the ability to be able to perceive 3D better, which seems like a, a, a bit of a funny cop-out, but that's where he leaves his defense. Swan launches a debate, a, a theoretical defense, and he says that we should consider capital as putty capital, which is comparable to Lego or Meccano. In that a single, that, that we can consider these capital or units of capital as being malleable to the situation. But the theoretical debate is very easily squashed. Here you can see that this a boat and a rod can't be putty capital for two nets. And he's trying to say that we're using two units of putty capital here and two, and we've just moved them into two different units of putty capital there. Not taking into account that uh, some capital is completely different from other types of capital. Samuelson tries to make a save of of capital theory by saying that we use a surrogate production function. There is a production function within the production function. And the production function within the production function means that we can combine these elements in a production function and then say that that production function is then compound, compounded with the digging production function. We can consider this all one unit of capital and we link it with the one unit of labor over here and we output one whole. Well, there are problems with that. Um, and the problems arise in that it becomes an entangling function. And it's not actually solving the, the, the core issue here. The core issue still remains that we can't take things like marginal ideas uh, and use capital and labor in a production function setting, uh, even if you were to surrogate the production functions. The fourth round is a try, an attempt to try and save capital theory by means of Bliss and Hahn's ideas that we could price it as a general equilibrium, in essence that each of the, the elements of capital would be would be paid its endowment and its factor returns. They use general equilibrium to generate a static result, which runs into a small problem of round two. But their final attempt is to simply save the parable that as capital increases while all other things remain unchanged, interest falls. And as labor forces increase, if other things remain the same, wages fall. Unfortunately, the reality is the best we can do in this offering is to say that we have, can sign the difference about interest rate associated with different quantity of capital. In essence, the larger the capital quantity of capital we can a sign, as in say it's plus or minus, depending on the situation and using a general equilibrium model to prove it. It's quite a weak result. It essentially means that the capital, con capital, Cambridge capital controversy shows that there isn't this natural idea that we are substituting away from capital and labor, and in doing so, the interest rate falls and labor rate falls, 
and all things remain the same, the wages will fall. These are, the, 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 there is a problem here. Okay. Perhaps the conclusions of the Cambridge Capital debate will be better enjoyed than the rounds of punching exchanged. What does the end of the Cambridge Capital debate tell us? Well, it has some large implications. First of all, its implications to, to macroeconomics are that it stops growth models. These idea of growth models such as the, the Solo and Swan, the Arrow Hirund model, um, Harrod Domar models, they run into massive problems when dealing with these sort of issues. This limits the predictive power. of these models. And with decreased predictive power, I think you would agree that, these, that, that it's probably not a good idea to want to try and use this to inform policy if indeed there are fundamental problems with it. On a micro economic level, it states things that, things like the marginal rates of labor and the marginal rates of capital are not something that we can theoretically or mathematically take. So marginal rates are a fallacy. Substituting between labor-heavy and capital-intensive processes is not necessarily things. So the marginal rate of substitution does not exist. rates being determined from capital or because of demand of capital goods dubious anybody else who's, who's enjoyed these last two lectures can see what some of the other implications of the Cambridge capital controversy They're numerous, I'm just giving you these five, but modeling a firm's long run growth path is also a problem. Do you remember in your first year you would have been used to these diagrams where we describe the long run growth path as being the lowest point of these series of production functions and each production function rests nested on it and eventually we get this production function which indeed is on the long run well that whole section which must be many weeks of your studying falls out of the out of play quite quickly here we can't necessarily speak about these long run growth paths There's another important part that the Cambridge Capital Controversy also brought about. Despite this being a sort of peak point in economic thought, we've just gone through the marginalists, we've had a consolidation, we've now reached a, a boiling point. There is a re-emergence of ideology. Schools of thought split pretty much across the Atlantic. American schools of thought continue to this day to be heavily 
concerned with mathematical methods. Americans never recovered from this hit, and they've gone on to try and use some really crafty stuff to try and make other uh, conclusions, many of which are dubious. Economics in American higher institutions is not, is sometimes is easily mistakenable for a course in higher mathematics, in set theory or point theory. And the application of the high theory is that at best limited. Across the Atlantic in Britain, there was a revivalism of the idea that economics had gone too far. The mathematics in it were obscuring the core problems. The solutions that we've been working to were based on things which, which are, have inherent composition faults. And we should revive the old ideas of political economy. A return to classical thought at a time when mathematical skills were at its strongest. And it almost shows that it's gone full circle. This sort of ideology is the ideology that Bowles picks up with on his institutional thoughts. And you might have heard in your own Bowles textbook in Advanced Micro Macro of the idea of the classical conundrum. Have you heard of that? The, hmm? the classical constitutional classical constitutional conundrum, as he describes it. It emerges now from this period. A little bit must be said about the practical relevance of this. It's very hard sometimes to show some of these reswitchings. The general equilibrium models are impossibly tricky to prove. People defend the results, this, this win by Cambridge, Schraffer and Robinson, by saying that these events are unlikely. In fact, the reading I've set for you tries to give a balanced approach and says, you know, we shouldn't throw it all out, ah, it's salvageable, not enough empirical evidence. The reality is, is that depending on who you read, and the reading I've just chosen is a more balanced approach, you get people in either ends of the, of, the, uh, of the extreme. I myself sit in the end where there is a lot of empirical evidence that people neglect to read that shows that these things have inherent problems. And you can rest assured that these five building lectures were not in vain. Others will try and say to you that we should keep reconsidering it, but in real terms, I think they must know in their heart that they cannot keep going. The balanced approach is possibly only the best approach, but it requires a rethink of what we teach as economics and the theory we use from first year in order to try and reflect that indeed a lot of things, these things reaching long-run growth paths are a fallacy of composition. Finally, because of its link with interest rates, we just need to touch on the last little bits. Yesterday we looked at other contributors to how the interest rates worked. And I want to say a few short things about other schools of thoughts who came up with interest rates and related problems. Immediately when we think of booms and busts, we think of Keynes. But there are other big contributors who tend to try and explain boom and bust theory. Poetry uh, is a predecessor to Stephen King. He says that the world is divided into traders, manufacturers, and households, and that a monetary disturbance occurs through the traders, and depending on the way that the traders are learning, it can, it can set off a boom or bust. Lindahl spent a long time formulating what he calls the Vixel process. Remember from our lectures, we spoke about Vixel, saying that we have that when the interest rate diverges, we have a, we stay on a path and this path doesn't end until such a time as the natural rate is equal to the bank rate.
this diagram will become more easy to understand in the next moment. For the meanwhile, I hope the opportunity allows you to take it down. process which Hayek caught on to. Hayek said that booms and busts occur because of a fundamental weakness in the system of banks. Credit expansion occurs, there's a credit expansion which is produced when there's a boom. Entrepreneurs start sinking capital and invest sinking capital into capital goods. Many of these projects are unsustainable. There's a distortion in the structure of production. In essence, technological change can cause a re-switch between one process or another. Forced savings mean that there's a rise in prices which induces a transfer of real income from fixed income recipients. The forced savings arise in that they are investing into these capital goods, Real wages lag behind and labor is substituted for machinery, at which point the investment demand for capital dries up, mainly because the banks choke off the investment and the whole process swings around to contract more workers. So he was trying to explain an intricate linked thing with the production function along with booms and busts. There is a small problem that this is incorrect in that Hayek invokes a fallacy of non-neutrality of money and Schroeffer shows that forced and voluntary savings are in fact identical. And Schroeffer points out that his argument is essentially the same as loaning of goods through time. That Hayek's theory of booms and busts, which you would have learned about in second year, incurs a divergence from the natural rate and sometimes multiple natural rates. And that, uh, here's a nice summing up of what would happen, expounded through his theory and covered his blackboards with triangles, as Robinson on what Hayek's booms and busts theory is. You do remember boom Hayek's theory, you must be austere. The reason you must be, he, he, we only learn about what he recommended, which was that you must be austere, uh, and that uh, austerity will bring back the economy into equilibrium. Here is some, this is the, the mechanism by which he was recommending it. And here is a lovely example of the fallacy of his thoughts. The whole argument, as we see later, consisted in confusing the current rate of investment with the total stack of capital goods, but we could not make it out at the time. The general tendency to see to show a slump was caused by consumption. But Kahn, who was at the time involved, explained that the multiplier guaranteed that savings always equaled investment, it's from Keynes, asked in a puzzled tone to higher. Is your view that if we went out tomorrow and bought a new overcoat, that it would increase unemployment? Hayek said yes, but pointing, to the, but pointing at his triangles on the board, it would take a very long mathematical argument to explain why. This is a two-second overnote, non-examinable, to simply show you that there are problems with Hayekian thoughts and uh, his boom and bust contributions. In the ideal world, things would go slower and we could cover more. Here are a few economists who would have been lovely to cover as part of this course for their contributions to history of economics. 
some that you might be familiar with, like hex, the hex decomposition. Others which you should meet, like Akerlof, Arrow, De Bruyne, Van Neumann for his contributions to game theory, Kalek, Harrod, Hirschman, Oscar Lang, Meltzer. And finally, I must acknowledge my indebtedness to the five books which I read once again in comprising these five lectures. So it worked out to be about 200 pages of theory per lecture. Whether it was worth it or not, I'm yet to say. But to the books by Robbins, Bork, Bau, Gill, Blue, Bergie, and Grunenbachen. But now it's over to you. Yeah. Nicholas teaching you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. would be the best path after Cambridge capital controversy? I mean, I mean, do we do we stay with neoclassicalism? Do we stay? No. The Cambridge capital controversy. The concluding remark is that we really need to consider heavily about what neoclassical economics can inform for micro and macro policy. Um, and the, there hasn't been a great research. It remains an open topic something that, uh, that needs to be addressed by economic theory. We continue to teach a neoclassical approach because we don't know anything better. Um, but the neoclassical approach is so fundamentally flawed in itself that sometimes it might be better considering a return to these ideas of classical economics before the era of huge mathematics and inductive logic to the sort of thoughts of Ricardo, Smalls and Adamson. Was that an enjoyable lecture series? Thank you.